Welcome everyone to the uh, second event, a conversation in uh, a series that is uh, sponsored by the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory at University of Chicago, of which I'm um, this year a co-director. <clears throat> and um, this is a series I started um, to try to keep intellectual cross um, institutional um, uh, intellectual life going uh, in the pandemic, but recognizing uh, Zoom exhaustion, I also wanted to just actually use Zoom for uh, what it benefits, which is to shrink space. And so to gather together people um, with um, similar interests in uh, materiality and uh, in contemporary theory uh, across uh, oceans, uh, ac across thousands of miles so that we can be together and, uh, and chat. Um, the second um, impulse for this is that uh, I um, am very interested and in, I really enjoy more dialogic formats um, in uh, scholarly life, um, either at conferences or on campus. Um, maybe I'm just a, a more informal person, but um, I think also that uh, this might be a, a desire that's um, shared with more more people. So I really hope that this is a, um, uh, I want this and everyone's been cooperative so far of making this a real um, kind of, not entirely off the cuff, but closer to the cuff um, conversation and back and forth, a dialogue. So um, I'll, I'll introduce um, Paul Graves Brown. Uh, and then we'll, uh, uh, I'll turn it over to him to introduce the project that we're going to focus on talking about. I'll shoot him some questions and then we're going to open it to the floor and we'll keep it to about an, uh, a, a lunch hour. Um, so uh, not to, again, exhaust everybody on, on Zoom. So um, it's, it's a real pleasure um, to uh, welcome uh, Paul to this, um, uh, this forum. Um, I, uh, I, let me just say personally, uh, I don't know, Paul, how long we've known one another. I, I know you've known some of the people in this room, the Zoom room, longer than um, me, but it's going on 10 years probably um, through various events and such. But what um, I miss, what stands out for me that I'm very grateful for is that Paul was an amazing host when I was visiting the UK just a few years ago, uh, maybe five years ago, something like that. Um, when I was there for an academic gig, but I uh, wanted to be a little bit of an um, archaeological tourist, too. And we share an interest in cemeteries, and he took me to Highgate Cemetery, where I got to encounter um, many wonderful uh, old souls or dead souls, but um, most especially what stands out, of course, is Karl Marx. Um, it was a, a little bit of a pilgrimage. Um, but, and it was a typical rainy day, and I remember scampering down a hill, um, perhaps through some path, down to a road where Paul um, uh, had um, uh, discovered, or was on his uh, list of, of places to visit, a wonderful, warm, welcoming pub, uh, an old English pub that I don't know if it were, if it was, um, yet taken over by the Starbucks uh, of pubs uh, in, in London. It seemed like it was not one of the rare ones that was not. But what was really remarkable is it had amazing vegan Indian food. Um, so it was the, the best of, of New England, um, the New England. And so um, thank you, um, Paul. And I think Paul's skills as a um, tourist, or excuse me, as a tour guide, of London are going to be on display here. Um, Paul has probably one of the most um, amazing and varied uh, CVs I've ever had the pleasure to introduce. Um, I, I had some awareness of his, uh, one of the wonderful things about introducing friends is you learn new things about them when you get a hold of their full CV and take a look or their bio. And I knew that he um, had skills in uh, sound. I did not realize that he was a BBC sound engineer for um, many years uh, and uh, before going into archaeology or back to archaeology. I'm not quite clear about that trajectory, but also that he's um, a uh, electronic musician himself for 40 years and a composer. Um, and uh, that explains some of the interest in what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, but also um, in terms of archaeology, I didn't realize that he had started off um, doing more evolutionary um, 
archaeology and anthropology or evolutionary theory. So he's really about the two ends of the human spectrum. Um, and because then what he went on to do was to switch to uh, modern material culture. And he um, is very well known in the field as uh, one of basically one of the founders as a recognized field of the archaeology of the contemporary, um, particularly through uh, a couple of edited volumes uh, bringing together like minded or emerging minds uh, on uh, these matters uh, in 2000, uh, uh, Matter, Materiality and Modern Culture. And then in 2013, the Oxford Handbook of the Archaeology of the Contemporary World, which I use a lot in my teaching. Very important texts um, that really um, sketched out that archaeology does not have to be about antiquity or even the antique, that really um, it's a study of human material relations, which has been uh, a, a quiet revolution in the field and I think is one of the most exciting and interesting things going on. Um, so today he's um, going to uh, take us on a tour of uh, pop archaeology in uh, London, a, a project that started um, uh, over 10 years ago. And um, it has, as we were um, chatting, and, I, and I've known by um, being a fan of his work, uh, that uh, it's had a couple different phases and uh, has um, attended to a couple different phases of rock and roll and pop music culture. Um, but uh, I'll let Paul um, tell us how this project got started and, and what he wants to uh, focus on today. So welcome, Paul. Right. Well, thanks for the intro. <laughs> I'll, I'll start the... Um, I'm going to use a bit of a PowerPoint just to show you some pictures, because that's the easiest way to do this. Right. Hopefully you can all see that. I can just about see it. Right, so this is the kind of sketch map of um, Soho, which, if you don't know, London is an area, as the map shows, just to the north of Trafalgar Square. Now, in Soho is a kind of classic example of what you might call a bohemia, in that um, it, it's always been a kind of, well, you might say a kind of marginal area. Um, a big population of French Huguenots in the, well, the 17th and 18th century, and even today there's a pub in the, in, in the area which is widely known as the French pub and which still insists on serving drinks in uh, metric sizes. Um, one of the odd things about doing this is that I can't really tell if you can hear me or not, but I hope you can. Um, we, we, we can we can hear you, Paul. We're good. <laughs> it's just uh, I can't see myself, so I can't really tell. Anyway, right. So if I if I start with the, I was just going to start with just a couple of sites, give you a flavour of the kind of sites there are or were around this area. And believe me, there have been hundreds over the years. So I'm going to start with the the Marquee Club, which is in Mordor Street. Um, so the Marquee was one of the sort of primary venues for pop and rock music. It, it originally, well, it opened in Wardle Street in 1964 and was there until 1988. And just about anybody who was anybody um, performed there. Um, it actually started slightly earlier than that as the jazz club, really, in around the corner in Oxford Street. And um, one of the things about these clubs was that... Um, they they didn't have a drinks license, so what they had to do was that halfway through the evening they'd stop, and everybody would go out to the nearest pub, and then they'd come back. Now, um, what they did was that um, um, they used to allow new acts to perform during the interval, and I think in about 1962, one of these interval acts were some band called the Rolling Stones who were playing their second ever gig. Now, I mean, the marquee is long gone. As I say, it closed in Wardle Street in 88. And although it had a couple of other stints in, in, in places around London, it eventually packed in about, I think, about five years later. And, and this is characteristic of the way things have changed from the sort of 60s and 70s in that what was a bohemia has gradually been eroded by gentrification. Um, 
the site is now marked by this plaque to Keith Moon. I'm not altogether sure why it was that somebody chose to put up a plaque to Keith Moon particularly. Well, I'm sure the Who played the marquee loads of times, but um, why, why Keith Moon gets a plaque, I don't know. But we'll be seeing a number of these other plaques and you'll find these things all over London. Um, They'd have been better off to have put the plaque on this pub of shit because this was the pub that people went to from the marquee and Keith Moon certainly got himself banned from the ship for letting off smoke bombs in the toilets. So um, to move on to the next one, which is again, it's just down the bottom, Mason's Yard, just outside Soho. Now, this one's a quite interesting um, and you get two for the price of one. The building on the picture on the left was the location of a club called the Scotch St James, which opened in 1965. Typical of a lot of these clubs around the 60s, they didn't last very long. Some of them only lasted a few months. What makes this one stand out is that in September 1966, this was the first place that Jimi Hendrix played when he came to London. In fact, as I understand it, he did an impromptu gig there the day he arrived in London with Chaz Chandler from New York. And loads of people claim they were there. It's one of these events where loads of people claim they were there, but nobody knows <laughs> they really were. Paul McCartney certainly said he was there and that it changed his life, but other people said he wasn't. Um, just across this little yard, I mean, it really is just a yard that you can only get to down an alley at the side of a pub, was this place called the Indica uh, gallery and bookshop and what's the problem about that well I mean it was um, it was part of what was called the underground scene at the time the, the British version of the counterculture run by these guys called Barry Miles and um, John Hopkins who was known as Hoppy the Hippie um, so it was part of the counter countercultural scene uh, they had some funding off of Paul McCartney, who was quite into this sort of thing. And also in 1966, November 1966, um, this was where John Lennon met Yoko Ono when she had an exhibition at the gallery. Hendrix, of course, lived in this flat on the left in Brook Street. And you can see yet another plaque, which is the one on the right. The one on the left is to the composer George Frederick Handel, although of course they weren't living there at the same time. And uh, of course, he didn't die there, he died in this place on the right, the, um, oh, what's it called, um, let me think, blah, 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 blah. I don't mind. Well, it's, it's a hotel in, um, in Notting Hill where he died in 1970. And I believe that if you really wanted to, you could rent the room where he died. Um, so, returning to the map, the next place I want to take you to is Denmark Street. Now, I mean, Denmark Street was the kind of focus of the growing popular music industry in London. It gets described as London's Tin Pan Alley, taking its name from the one in New York. Um, it was originally, most of it was originally built in the 1680s, about the same time as um, Downing Street. Uh, where our stupid Prime Minister lives, although apparently the decorating costs were a lot cheaper in those days. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, you can see here it says Lawrence Wright Publishing, they opened uh, their premises there in 1911. A number of other publishers followed the prominent newspaper, the, um, oh, I've forgotten what that was, but it went on mine. Um, and so there was a growing um, range of publishers. There was a cafe on the corner, which became very much a kind of meeting place for musicians, particularly in the 60s. There were music shops and um, this place at number, let me see, this would be number four, Regent Sound Studios opened in 1962. And this was where the Rolling Stones made their first recordings, I think in 1964, in somewhat primitive conditions, according to Keith Richards. Um, moving on, the other place, and this is one that um, John Schofield and I spent a lot of our time on, 
is number six. Now you see another blue plaque next to it, and that's to uh, one Augustus Sieber, who apparently was the inventor of the deep sea diving suit. But uh, number six has gone through various incarnations. It was a Greek bookshop for many, many years. But what interested us is this other building, which you can see in the picture on the right, which is at the back. And this is where in 1975, the Sex Pistols leased um, a rehearsal space. The rehearsal space had originally been created by another band called Badfinger, who were the first band ever signed to the Beatles Apple label. But um, their lead singer committed suicide in 1975 and they sold the license to Malcolm McLaren. Um, we believe that it was originally constructed as a silversmithing workshop to make uh, church plate like um, chalices and candlesticks. So it's kind of slightly ironic that it ended up as the home of the Sax Pistols. And in fact, Steve Jones more or less lived in this flat on the first floor. That's US second floor, I guess, um, for most of the time they were together. So you can see them all there with Malcolm McLaren in the picture on the left. But sometime in the spring of 1977, they had the place redecorated and John Lydon didn't like this. So he got out his marker pen and started doing graffiti all over the walls. And as you can see on the right, we've got um, his representation of Sid Vicious, so he just called Ego Sloshos. And here we have Malcolm McLaren grasping the money in his hot little hand and on the right is Lydon's self-portrait. This slide was my kind of composite drawing of all the graffiti and there is a lot of it but the stuff that's in black is basically the, the stuff that John Lydon did. So you've got pictures of himself, McLaren, Steve Jones, uh, Nancy Spungen, Sid and the other two, plus some more obscure ones. And then there was a whole kind of palimpsest of graffiti. The stuff in blue seems to date from the beginning of the 1980s when John Lydon's brother's band were using the place of re rehearsal space. And also the uh, Sarah and Kieran at the bottom are two members of Burunana Rama who lived there in uh, about 1981-82, I think. Anyway, right, so the last <coughs> of these four is Hedden Street. And this was actually where I got started because John Schofield uh, kind of brought this place to my attention sometime in the late noughties. And um, the significance of Hedden Street, it was here in 1972 in January that um, David Bowie was photographed for the cover of Ziggy Stardust. And uh, the phone box in particular has been a place of pilgrimage ever since. Although, as you can see, the phone box that's there now on the right is not the same. Technically speaking, it's a K6 and the one that David Bowie is standing in is a K2. And um, the phone box is almost always covered in Bowie related graffiti. And we know from this article in Time Out that um, it's been being graffitied at least since 1984, but from one or two things I've read, probably a lot earlier than that. Um, it got a, a plaque in 2012 put up by the Crown Estate, which effectively means it was put up by the Queen. Um, but then when Bowie died in uh, 2016, January 10th, it became one of the foci of these shrines to David Bowie. So here it is. I think that was just a few days after he died. Um, and it's one of three, really. Uh, the other one is this one in Tunstall Road in Brixton. Um, and this again is probably January, February 2016. Um, and it's been a, an active shrine pretty much ever since. The, the The painting was originally done in 2013 by a guy who specialised in this sort of thing, presumably to <coughs> coincide with the um, Bowie, David Bowie Is exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, 
Barry himself was actually born just up the road in this house on the left in Stansfield Road, but we didn't see much sign of anybody leaving any stuff outside the house. And, and in, in a way, the, the actual mural doesn't really have any direct connection to Bowie, apart from the fact that he lived in Brixton for the first four years of his life. <laughs> the mural itself went through, uh, has gone through a number of sort of stages because they put various covers over it to stop people graffitiing on it, as you can see from this note. But people just then started putting graffiti on the cover over it. Um, the third location, Bowie related location, uh, is this place in um, Beckenham. Now, Bowie spent most of his early life in Beckenham in 1969, August 1969. He and the Beckenham Arts Lab organised this free festival centred on this bandstand. So that's also become one of the foci of um, Bowie Shrine, but it's also the scene of a, an annual festival organised by local people, partly to commemorate Bowie and partly to hopefully raise money to repair the bandstand. And this lady on the left, the lovely Wendy, is the person who organises it. Now, assuming that I've got time, and tell me no if I don't, I'll just run through one or two of the other places that to Hillary on Orange and I looked at in terms of shrines. Um, this is on Barnes Common, which is in South London, down at the bottom left there, which is where Mark Boland died in 1977 when his car hit a tree. The barrel in the back marks the side of the tree because a couple of years ago somebody decided to chop it down. This, uh, this is in the main, the kind of the most long lived of these sites in the sense that people seem to have been visiting and leaving stuff at the site since his death in 77. Um, and over the years, a couple of statues of various kinds have been put up and those little plaques on the steps, if you can see them, have been added in memory of various people associated with Bolan and T-Rex that have died subsequently. And you will see on the notice board, I think you can see on the side on the right, uh, people from amazing a range of different places around the world come to this really obscure little back road in South London to visit the shrine. Um, another one, and what's interesting about this one is that it's not there anymore. And this is the wall outside um, Freddie Mercury's house in Earl's Court. Now, for many years, there were all these tributes that were left on the wall outside. And at some stage, presumably, somebody involved with owning the property actually put this plastic screen over these things to protect them. But then a couple of years ago, they suddenly decided that they didn't want them any, anymore. And now it's all gone. Uh, this is Camden Square Gardens. North London and this is where Amy Winehouse died in 2011 and again I mean I've only got a slide of one of the trees there's basically four trees opposite the house and uh, all of them are constantly covered in these tributes one kind or another when she died there was literally piles and piles of flowers right outside the house but the more permanent tribute which has been around what, for about 10 years now I guess still on the other side of the road centered around these trees even though the council try and get rid of it and my last one is this which um is george's garden um george michael died in december 2016 and very shortly afterwards people started to um, build this really elaborate garden on a piece of ground which is kind of just outside his former home in highgate and i think i've got another slide of that there and some of these gardens are amazingly elaborate with kind of electronic picture um, screens and goodness knows what something similar outside his uh, his other home in uh, to the west of London um, George's garden itself kind of 
as I think with Freddie Mercury, there was a lot of complaints from local residents. And eventually, I think in May of 2018, it was all cleared away. And the last time we were there, apart from the odd few bits and pieces hanging from trees, it had all disappeared. So, as I said, I, I need to thank John Schofield for, help, for working with me on the Sex Pistols and also Hilary Orange, with whom I worked together on the Rock Shrines. And that is that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Maybe I we'll... hope it wasn't too long. <laughs> no, no, no. I, and I think I uh, you've given... for hours. <laughs> No, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. Um, so uh, I know you have thoughts about this. So um, I, I have lots of things um, going through my mind about spontaneous shrines and um, uh, this new tradition uh, of public mourning. But um, I, I don't want to preempt it with my own kind of theoretical um, reflections. I want to hear from you. Uh, what? What are you thinking these days um, in terms of what this tells us about um, social practice or um, how, how are you, in, what, what are the most interesting interpretive threads that you found through this work? But for some mad reason, I kind of latched onto this work by this guy called David Reisman, who I think I mentioned to you. Now, I mean, Reisman and colleagues published this book in 1950 called The Lonely Crowd, which it's claimed is the biggest selling sociology book of all time and yeah you know in the literature now it, it seems to have completely disappeared although it was clearly very influential and as i said to you before i mean it, he he was quite friendly with with some of the um frankfurt school emigres and and particularly with anna Arendt. and you can see in her book the human condition that he definitely his work definitely influenced Arendt. so I mean, if I could just briefly kind of, and there, there are basically, I mean, there's a lot of burble in the book, but the kind of the high concept, if you like, is that he, he saw social values and the way people constructed their social values in terms of three basic types of tropes. One was what he called tradition directive, which, as you might imagine, means that people take their values from tradition, from which I assume you include things like religious tradition. Then he called, he had a second one, which he called internally directed, which he described as people having a kind of internal gyroscope, which I think is quite a nice metaphor, by which they, 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 they judge things. And I assume that that means like kind of, well, that it includes ide ideological commitments. So there's a bit in the human condition where Hannah Arendt says, you know, when people in the Third Reich tried to decide um, how to solve some personal dilemma, they would ask themselves, what would the Fuhrer do? You know? <laughs> um, but the third one, and I think the one that's, that's most interesting in this context, is what he called other directiveness. And, and this was what led me to him, really, from looking at um, what they called slopes, sites left over after planning, and coming across a book by Canadian geographer who called them other directed places and basically what it means is uh, in, in, in contemporary parlance that people crowdsource their values um, that's the that's the, the nub of it really yeah that's, that's super fascinating um do you think that um I, I was wondering also about um, through your tour, you know, there was a palimpsest as expected in an old city like London of different um, social spaces and, and practices. Um, I guess I have two questions. One is, are these social spaces or are they spaces that people are interacting with as part of the lonely crowd as individuals? Um, uh, to the extent that you've been able to observe or interpret and then um, secondly, over the history of, you know, you started in the, um, mostly, I think, in the early 60s forward, um, what about the, the, the social place and space uh, of, of music? Um, how is that expressed in the landscape and the materiality, the, the music, culture, um, social relationship? Um, so, you know, th those are two big questions, but take what you will. Well, in terms of the shrines, I mean, thinking about it more recently, I, I think 
they kind of fall into into several different categories. I mean, the Bail and Shrine, for example, definitely has a kind of community. I mean, we were talking earlier about the fourth, oh, well, starting today, the TAG conference, but there's another TAG, which is the uh, T-Rex Action Group, who actually own that plot of land uh, where the Bail and Shrine is, and, and seem to have been managing it now for, for a number of years. And there's obviously a, a very kind of well-structured community around that. And, and likewise with the, the I mean, the, the thing about the Bowie stuff is that there's definitely a kind of Brixton, Beckenham tension as to kind of who owns David Bowie. When when Bowie died on the, I think it's called the Roxy Cinema in Brixton, there's this big sign that said something like, RIP David Bowie, our Brixton boy. But if you speak to people in Beckenham, they definitely think that he's a, and, and, and actually I think he was. I mean, Bowie was, was a, a suburban person and you get you do get the sense that there is a kind of a community thing going on around that bandstand. If I went to the, the festival once and, and would go again and it's definitely got a, a much more kind of local community feel. You take the 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 the, well, the shrine in Brixton, I mean, as I said, really, I mean the actual site itself has absolutely nothing to do with Bowie. I mean, yes, he was born in a house what it's about three, four hundred meters away from where it is. But it, it just so happened that this guy had painted this mural in 2013 and it seems to have spontaneously become a kind of focus of Bowie tributes. I mean it's right opposite Brixton tube station, so and it's you know it's a quite nice convenient locale. But apart from that, it is very much this kind of <laughs> lonely crowd sense of just this kind of atomistic fragmentary individual little contributions that build up into this thing but there's no real community around it um, what was the other question or other point yeah no no that um i guess i just have a follow-up with that it just makes me think about um that there's a real parallel this is this is materiality this is through space but it seems like there's a real parallel to how we interact with um media and social media and virtual media uh, that the lonely crowd um, might be a really interesting um, old model to go back uh, to to think about that. Um, and, you know, as you know, there are lots of virtual shrines um, for various celebrities um, and, you know, fake Instagram sites and, and all the rest. And, and um, I uh, was what your thoughts have made me think about um, fandom um, as uh, a, a relatively um, recent social formation that, again, might be part of the, it, it can be the lonely crowd, but it could also be groups of people like the Bolin group that really know one another um, and locate one another. And I just think it's really interesting to look at social history through this lens. But that brings me back to this, the second question I threw at you, um, which was, what sort of changes this, um, as, as music changes and, and the relationship um, and the the landscape has changed in London. Uh, what are, how does it kind of index um, social changes um, for you uh, over time between 1962 and the present, if, if you were to think about it that way? Um, well, I mean, I think it was Simon Frith, who's a quite prominent writer on, on popular music. And I think it was him who said this, that, and essentially the, the Bohemia has now moved into people's bedrooms. I mean, for example, what's striking if you look at the careers of George Michael and Amy Winehouse is that they kind of went, you know, I mean, George Michael and and uh, and, it, and his partner, they, they just bumped into a guy in the pub in this fairly posh village that they lived in just outside London who happened to be an A&R man for a record company. Amy Winehouse was spotted by uh, somebody when she was in the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. They didn't, they weren't part of that kind of um, older tradition of people, you know, playing in clubs and pubs and stuff. Um, and, you know, as I briefly mentioned, I mean, that whole area of Soho as a bohemia 
it, it's it's rapidly disappearing if it hasn't virtually disappeared because all these places you know what used to be the marquee club is now some kind of upmarket restaurant the film industry used to be based in soho in the same street in water street that's all gone most um, most uh, I, I saw a thing two days ago about the headquarters of one of the um i can't remember which film company it was in soho square which developers want to knock down and redevelop into flats the, the sex pistols rehearsal studio is in the process of being turned into kind of upmarket accommodation where one of its unique selling points is they've got all this john line graffiti on the wall which has got statutory protection so you know all of that sort of focus in the center of went and it moved out gradually into sort of the bits of London which are not quite in the centre and not quite in the suburb. I mean, the reason why Amy Winehouse lived in Camden was because, you know, you had all these places around Camden where people played, which were mostly kind of pubs and stuff. Um, but they, it was cheaper because what drove it, you know, most of these places out of the centre was that the, the rents were just too much and they had to go. But even then, you know, ultimately i think <laughs> most of it's being pushed right out of the city altogether and in any case the whole idea of the sort of the the circuit of venues and and people going through that kind of route as i say the bohemia has now moved into people's bedrooms essentially and yeah, I, um, I'm going to open it now to the general questions, but I just a follow up thought. One of the things I've um, struggled to understand about um, the, the bohemian allure of uh, New Orleans, which it's it's had sort of identified uh, music and red light districts, Storyville and the French Quarter, um, now Treme uh, and the Marigny that um, uh, really draw has for different in different eras driven tourism but almost out of an immediate nostalgia like it, it, so what, one of my questions is is like um there, there are a lot of uh clubs and restaurants and and this kind of commodification of what once was uh this more organic and uh, resented um by the planning agencies and, and chamber of commerce uh, type of um uh, it wasn't a shadow economy. It was legal, but um, let's let's say not sal um, uh, not not for upstanding citizens. But as soon as things get banned, or as soon as it's no longer viable um, with a, uh, a a local public, it becomes commodified in this nostalgic way for um, for tourists coming from outside to visit what once was. And one of my questions that I struggle with, because I think New Orleans is always dancing on this, does that nostalgia, the nostalgic tourism itself help revivify or or is it kind of a zombification of, of the, that uh, music society relationship or those um, bohemian spaces? They can be very lively social spaces of total strangers. Uh, brought together through a commodity image of um, what was once a lively um, uh, bohemian scene. It's not something I'm familiar to anyone who pays any attention to these intensely touristed port cities in particular. Um, but uh, yeah, um, but I've, I've said too much. I hear, I see a couple of questions in the chat. I want to open it. We've made, as you may have noticed, that. Um, uh, we've made this uh, not a webinar, uh, but a, a meeting. So um, you can uh, unmute and uh, and uh, turn your video on if you'd like to ask a question. If you're not comfortable, you don't have good um, connection, uh, we can do it in uh, the, ta the uh, chat. There are um, two um, questions or comments in the chat, one from Dante and uh, one from Simon. Would you like to just speak your... Um, question Dante if you're still here would you like me to read it don't mean to put you on the um I believe you should be able to unmute yourself now 
Okay, I'll just read. Um, let me go back up. I'm not hearing from Dante. They should be able to unmute themselves now. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself now. But I'm not, I think I'm putting Dante on. The, um, uh, let's see. I'm having trouble getting my chat to work. Okay, uh, Dante, I, I would like to know Paul's thoughts about the relevance of public figures such as rock stars in our societies. Given archaeology fascination, with such figures, especially in old theoretical trends of interpretation of the past, focusing on kings, chiefs, and so on. What does your work bring to such uh, a mind frame? It's well, a big man, big man thesis. <laughs> this is all about big men um, and women. <laughs> I mean, one thing we did, are you hearing me now? Is, yes, go ahead. Right. So one thing we did consider is the kind of the sort of apotheosis of I mean, it's particularly noticeable in the case of Elvis Presley actually although I think that the, I mean and, and there is this this whole sense in which the visiting these sites does have a lot of the feel of the kind of religious pilgrimage about it somebody talking about Elvis just talked about it in terms of this kind of tactility and the fact that people bring things and they leave them and some of them are weird things like cartons of milk and old record pads. but in Elvis's case it's clear that it kind of extends to the point where he's like a kind of um, a saint in a sense that people appeal to him for his intercession with Bowie, it's slightly different. I mean, a lot of it, uh, well, a lot of the graffiti stuff revolves around the fact that he actually had quite a liberating effect for a lot of gay people in the early 70s by coming out and saying that he was gay, even though, to be honest, he wasn't. But, but it didn't really matter, the fact that he said it and he appeared on television with his arm around the guitarist of the spiders from Mars and a lot of the graffiti reflects that fact of people kind of thanking him for that and and that sort of things. but I mean we concluded I suppose in the end that he, he's not quite achieved godhead yet but um but but there is a kind of quasi I mean yeah a kind of quasi religious kind of aspect to a lot of this stuff yeah yeah yeah, that's certainly what I was thinking. And the, the parallels to saint shrines are, are kind of almost too obvious to state. Um, Simon Woodward, you had a question. Did you want to speak it or do you want me to read it? If you just, yeah, go for it. Excuse me. Yeah, okay, I'll see you then in a minute. Um, hi, yeah, so sorry, it's the way we consume music, Paul, these days, or it is consumed compared to what. Uh, to how we did, you know, I'm the same age as you, you know, gathering around friends records players. Does that change the way that we think about the musicians we idolise and therefore when they pass, whether or not we want to commemorate them? I'm thinking about, you know, Avicii, the, the DJ who passed a couple of years ago. You know, he's not treated at all in the same way as Bowie or Bolan. I don't know, because, I mean, if you look at George Michael, for example, or, or Amy Winehouse, they're both, you know, like kind of relatively recent artists. Um, I mean, I, I suppose one of the things is, my own impression is that, that music doesn't quite have the same, um, doesn't have the same role that it had for people in the past anyway. It's not quite so... Um, central to people's um to people's cultural life as it used to be does that answer the question yeah was the question i mean it sounds like in in part we're trying to um muddle through generational differences and, and how much they have to do with, with things um <clears throat> that are specific to the social experiences of um you know gen x or baby boomers versus today's um uh, millennials and uh, I mean, one thing is, but... you, you could say, I mean, we're, it's kind of chicken and egg situation in the mm -hmm. sense that obviously popular music's become very really kind of virtualized, it, it doesn't revolve around that physicality of record players. Now, I mean, but whether that 
precedes the sense in, in which I think, you know, even into the ages and uh, well, I suppose the last kind of big movement where it really kind of galvanized was electronic dance music in the late 80s and early 90s when when you got the sense of there being a kind of a kind of major kind of cultural movement built around music but since then i i can't really well i mean others may disagree but i can't really think of the sense of it having that kind of role as, as a particular cultural movement i suppose well i mean yeah but i, I suppose things like uh, house and uh, well uh, hip-hop and stuff but then they were kind of contemporary with that dance music maybe a bit well somewhat earlier but kind of running through the same period but yeah. if you think now it, it and it, it maybe it's also the way in which the kind of the roles of musicians have, have changed in that they start out with godhead rather than mm. I mean, and then they, they can only go down from there. But, but I was sitting, you know, the striking thing is that, you know, you go back to the 60s and you didn't have the same culture. So it was perfectly normal for, you know, people, members of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones to be hanging out in these little clubs mm -hmm. in London because, you know, whereas now, you know, th these people are only seen from a very long way away in very big stadiums. The, the, the the whole scale of the thing is scale of interaction interesting yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah I, I was also thinking about I wonder if experiences of collective effervescence which certainly I think in the Chicago house scene uh, Joe Bonnie and I um, know about a, a, an honors thesis um, written by a, a very talented undergraduate just a couple years ago on this and certainly um, it indicates that, that that was really important to people's identity and their youth. Um, um, but, you know, the less that uh, live music plays in people's lives, maybe that also shifts the role of a um, musician as a figure. But Jeremy has had his hand up for a while. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Hi. Excuse me. Uh, Coming. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Thank you so much for this immensely uh, enjoyable uh, tour through the pop shrines of London. It makes me uh, eager to visit and make my own pilgrimages as soon as epidemiologically possible. Uh, I, my question was a bit different. I guess I was just wondering, uh, Paul, what sort of lens this casts on urban space in London generally? And I'm thinking here uh, of the work of a, a writer I quite admire. I don't know if you're aware of him, Ian Sinclair, and this notion of psychogeography oh, yeah. and pedestrianism that's particularly fecund in London, and uh, whether you'd want to comment on that at all. Thanks. Well, I don't know if there's a particularly kind of psychogeographical aspect is well, one thing you can say is that these sites only arise where there is a kind of um, a physical agora in which they can take place i mean one of the things that i didn't get around to say about is that in the case of both bowie and freddie mercury they seem to have gone out of their way not to have a grave or a site that resembles a grave and in the case of george michael um he's buried in a cemetery which isn't accessible to the public so people find a space in which to commemorate people and this can be a, a variety of different spaces quite often they're near the place that they died like with poland or where near where they lived or sometimes like the one in Tunstall Road in Brixton, it just seems to be purely kind of haphazard because there happens to be this mural there. But wherever it is, it's got to be somewhere that, that's kind of accessible and where people can hang out. And and, and in that sense, you know, I, I suppose that that's about as close as you can get to a kind of psychogeographical view of it um, as I can manage, really. Great. Um, there's a question um, that our Benedito Farrell is asking me to read. Um, uh, likely, many fans may have been unaware of Freddie Mercury's racial background prior to the film Bohemian Rhapsody. 
However, given the effective connection between Queen's music and national events, national in quotes, as exemplified by football fans singing We Are the Champions, um, which also was very popular at my high school, um, <laughs> do certain historical locations associated with pop music perpetuate a post-racial and nationalist understanding of pop culture? Here, could the owning of Bowie, who was a countercultural figure in many ways, in Brixton displace the locale's connection to reggae and other local Black music histories? And I also just wanted um, to add to this, uh, you know, Bowie died in New York, uh, as did John Lennon, obviously. So I wonder about like competing, you know, global geographies of some of these figures too, and who gets to claim them. But um, the, yeah, did, did that resonate at all these um, questions about um, trans uh, racial or um, post racial um, and post nationalist pop culture? Well, I mean, we did uh, look, certainly with, with the, the, the the shrines. We certainly, I mean, you know, with Bowie, it was uh, not just in New York where you know there were previous left, but but also in Berlin, uh, outside of his former apartment in in Schoenberg, and outside of the, um, the studio where he used to work in Berlin. Um, I mean, the, the the question about Freddie is quite an interesting one. Because, I, I, I mean, I, I think most people didn't really, never really kind of. Well, I mean, ultimately, with Freddie, as with George Michael, it, it's more about sexual politics than about about anything else, and and nobody ever seemed to pay much attention to the fact, you know, he was essentially of a, a Parsi family who had to leave Zanzibar and Ari in the early 60s when there was a local revolution and they were basically massacring everybody who was from the subcontinent. Um, but he went to school in Cal um, um, Calcutta or Mumbai or somewhere in this very kind of Polish boarding school. Um, but you wouldn't, I mean, and, you know, <sighs> Brixton, well, as I say, I mean, the thing about that is that you wonder just what Brixton's real role with Bowie is because he didn't live there for very long. Um, whether it overshadows other things, I don't know. Um, as I said, you know, in terms of kind of ethnicity, you've got the Blue Pack to Jimi Hendrix, and 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 I, I I was thinking about this, but I mean you know most most of the certainly most of the the, the, the sites or people that we've looked at in 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 the UK and in London tend to be quote unquote British, but there are others. I mean you know we we were quite interested in Prince and how. He was memorialised in in Minneapolis and this whole sort of partly I think of his own design around Paisley Park and how this shrine was created after his death and and the archive and stuff. Well, Paisley uh, Park is almost a shrine that he built to himself when he was yeah. still alive, right? His his urn, I don't know if you know this, is a three D printed version yeah. of Paisley Park. So there's like a doubling there too. Like okay. it was all he he had already intended it as a as a shrine to himself, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it would be interesting to to to, to wonder whether if you kind of created a kind of a database of all these places where there are shrines to whether there is a kind of bias towards white performers <sighs> yeah uh, I mean I think it's probably going to differ by by nation but uh, with yeah. um Jimi Hendrix are there is there shrine activity at those locales you showed the plaques um not that I know of, um, but it's certainly very popular. I mean, what happened with the, the flat was that, I mean, the, on the 40th anniversary of his death, there was like a temporary exhibition put on in the flat, which I went to. And that's now turned into this permanent, effectively a kind of permanent museum where they've kind of recreated the flat. And then they put up the blue plaque on the same. So not... 
because I suppose you know, I mean, he, he died such a long time ago that, that there's there was no kind of tradition, as far as I'm aware of, that was ever. But in terms of people kind of wanting to remember Hendrix, most certainly that was the case. Right. Um, Although he d it didn't, he died um, around the same time or a couple of years after Mark Bolin, I think. Um, no, 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 those are no, interesting. No, no, no. no. Hendrix, Hendrix died in... 71? September 1970. 70, okay. So it was like, Bolin actually died a month of the day after Elvis. <laughs> oh, okay. A little later. But not that big. I mean, we're still in the 70s. Yeah. I mean, I, I have read that there were a few, I mean, a few kind of places where tributes appeared to Elvis when he died, but but not so much as as he really Well, knew. like Paisley Park, he had the he has Graceland, right? He he built that, and it was um, it, it is very kind of shrine like uh, now. It's quite an amazing space. Um, I believe you visited a Graceland, didn't you, when you came to yeah, the, we uh, did yeah a conference a few years ago, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were obvious parallels. I mean, the wall outside was the graffiti on which apparently, you know, people have been doing that since the 1950s. Yeah. And, and they cleaned it all off every couple of years. And when we were there, you could see from the dates on the graffiti that it had been like about three or four years since the last time they cleaned it all off. And, and you get the same thing, Abbey Road Studios, which I didn't mention, the wall outside Abbey Road it goes through a similar process. People cover it in graffiti, it gets painted on it. Well, we're right at time. That does remind me, though, about, um, you know, these the duration of these um, shrines and activities. Some of them seem to only last for about a month after a death. Other times they get, you know, acts of renewal, but also acts of erasure. Um, yeah. At the Vietnam uh, Memorial, um, uh, the Smithsonian actively uh, takes snapshots and collects the artifacts that are left there, like the, the acts of curation versus erasure. Um, so there's a, a lot to talk about, and I hope you um, continue to work on this and treat us with publications. I, I want to thank everyone for coming, but also before you sign off, um, just uh, 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 announce our next um, event in the series with Alice von Bieberstein uh, called Treasure Hunting and Necrospeculation in Turkey, and that will be in about a month on Friday, May 28th, also at noon Chicago time. Um, so please join us. And uh, but right now I want you to all join us in thanking Paul for uh, sharing um, his uh, work and allowing us to get out of the house and into um, the streets of London. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. This was really fun. <laughs>